Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today, both here and online. A reminder, the hashtag is tech for the people. Um, if you want to tweet, we will take questions from all of the above. Um, my name is Georgia Bullen. I'm a senior data analyst here at the Open Technology Institute. Uh, the idea for today's event came when Ali Rahman and I, Ali Rahman from Code for Progress and I were debriefing about the community projects that OTI did with Code for Progress's first group of cohorts, first fellow, the uh, first year of fellows. We hosted a few conversations here over the last year around diversity and technology issues, but our hope and intention was to gather a group of people who are making change happen through the work that they do every day to talk about the larger issues as well as some, share some actionable advice that all of us can learn from and start using now. The topic of why women and minorities leave STEM fields, or truthfully, why we never get there in the first place, is a large topic area uh, that has, been, has many people engaged in research and writing and even starting organizations and programs to address it. According to the census, women and people of color represent fewer than 30% of STEM professionals, and that number has declined since 1990. When I was a student at Carnegie Mellon, we had a campus joke that we used to characterize the situation in computer science. The Dave to girl ratio is greater than one. As in there are more men named Dave <laughs> than women in computer science every year. <laughs> Looking at tech specifically, the beauty and challenge is that there are resources that make it possible to learn to be a technologist outside of traditional education paths. Programs like Code for Progress, Hear Me Code, Yes We Code, Black Girls Code, Hacker School, General Assembly, Outreachy, People of Color Techies, and even OTI's own Digital Stewards Program provide pathways to learn about technology. These programs cover everything from the technology development process to systems administration to responsible recycling of technology, and most importantly, problem solving and understanding what people actually need. In parallel, an increasing number of services have transitioned over to digital platforms. As many cities are starting to implement data-driven decision-making, ensuring that we have a workforce who can connect with the needs of everyone is increasingly important. However, our education system, our hiring process, the structures and environments of STEM organizations need to evolve to support a diverse workforce as well. I don't think I'm out of line to say that this isn't something we at New America or even just within OTI have figured out ourselves. We do have our digital stewards model that I mentioned and that we've been researching and working with in many communities around the world. We chose to partner with, we choose to partner with organizations like Code for Progress and Outreachy because we want to support the change that they are help making in the community broadly. And we are working with other programs at New America on some of the policy issues that lead to the problems limiting opportunities for women and people of color. But there's still more we can all do every day. So we're going to have two panels today. The first will focus on what leadership can do to address the diversity gap, uh, which I'll introduce everyone on in a moment. And the second, later today, uh, will be more of a nuts and bolts conversation about the day-to-day -day challenges and practices we can all adopt. That panel will feature Mariella Polino, a Code for Progress fellow, Tom Connor from Motley Fool, Brooke Hunter from Engine, and Mona Abdel Halim, who's the founder of Resonate.com. I hope all of you will stick around for the second panel. But first, I'll introduce our first panel. Um, we're honored to host such a rock star group of women. Uh, Alan's going to try to hold his own. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be tough. It's, it's going to be, be tough. tough, but he's going to try. Um, so I'll read I'll go through down the line in order. Um, starting with Anne Marie. Anne Marie Slaughter is currently the president and CEO of New America, where we are right now. Uh, she's the Bert G. Kerstetter University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University, uh, where she served as the policy planning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> From 2009 to 2011, she served as the Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, the first woman, woman to hold that position. In 2012, she published the article, Why Women Still Can't Have It All in the Atlantic, which quickly became the most read article in the history of the magazine and helped spawn a renewed national debate on the continued obstacles to genuine full male-female equity, which she is building into a book that will come out sometime. Anytime. <laughs> um, next, Anne Marie is uh, Megan Smith, who was named in September 24 the United States Chief Technology Officer in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, in this role, she serves as an assistant to the president, uh, focusing on how technology policy and innovation can advance the future of our nation. Megan Smith is an award-winning entrepreneur, engineer, and tech evangelist, most recently serving as a vice president at Google X, where she worked on a range of projects and co-created the company's Solve for X Innovation Community Project, as well as its Women Tech Makers Tech Diversity Initiative. Uh, next to Megan, we have Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Jessica Rosenworcel was nominated and confirmed in May 2012 to the Federal Communications Commission. 
Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel brings a decade and a half of public sector and private sector communications law experience to her position at the FCC. This experience has shaped her belief that in the 21st century, strong communications markets can foster economic growth and security, enhance digital age opportunity, and enrich our civic life. And next to Jessica, we have Alia Rahman, who's the Program Director for Code for Progress. As Program Director, Alia Rahman leads the recruitment in residence training and job placement of the Code for Progress fellows into full-time developer positions. Her work is informed by a background in legislative, electoral, and community organizing for racial and economic justice campaigns, and by a former life in public higher education conducting curriculum research and teaching computer programming and educational foundations and policy. Uh, and our moderator is uh, Alan Davidson, who is the New America Vice President for Technology, Policy, and Strategy and Director of the Open Technology Institute. He's also a research affiliate at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, where he is co-founder of the new MIT Information Policy Project. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alan. Excellent. And thank you, Georgia. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And thank you to our panelists. This is really a, it's a dream team of leaders thinking about this problem of diversity in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you all for being here. This is terrific. And our goal today is really to have a conversation. I'll ask a few questions to try and steer it, and then to save some time at the end for all of you in the audience to ask some questions, too. So think about your questions. We, we want to hear them. Um, why don't I just start with a, a, simple, uh, a simple general question. Maybe it's not so simple, but we've, sort of, we've framed this this way, which is to say um, the problem that we're looking at is that the people who are building the technology that so many of us use today, so many people use, they do not look like the people who are using the technology. They do not come from the same backgrounds as the people who are using that technology. Uh, and there's lots of data. Georgia talked about you know, the, uh, that 50% uh, of women in the workforce, but uh, less than 30% of them are actually uh, in this, uh, represented in the STEM fields. Uh, census did a study about, um, uh, there are probably, I think it's 11% uh, uh, of the workforce is black, 6% of the STEM workforce is black. Lots of statistics about this. Tell, maybe we'll just go down the line. Is, how do you see the problem? Is this a problem? Why is this a problem? How would you frame it? Why don't we start with Anne-Marie? So it is a problem. It's a very big problem. Uh, and it will, so let me say why I think of it as a problem from my perch uh, as first dean of a public policy school, then a government official, and now head uh, of a organization that is dedicated to solving public problems. So in all those areas, tech is the new indispensable language for solving public problems. So if you think about it, so solving public problems is generally what we call policy, but policy is just one way of solving public problems. Policy is law or regulation. That's how you solve public problems. Today, that is still very important. But tech is equally important. If you are thinking about how to solve problems from the environment to uh, uh, poverty reduction to uh, supporting women to health to the environment, whatever it is, if you are thinking only about law and policy, you're not serious. You're really not serious. But if you're thinking only, so you have to be thinking about tech. Now, I would say if you're thinking about tech and you're not also thinking about law and policy and politics, you're also not serious. So you have to have them both. And solving public problems, that's what government does. That's what the ecosystem of civic organizations does. That's increasingly what private co companies have to help do as well. So it's a, absolutely central to how we govern ourselves and how we thrive. And yet, only a very small portion of the population speaks tech, right? And so if I think about it from the point of view of, the public, of a public policy school, we teach everybody to do a certain amount of cost-benefit analysis. You have to understand the basics of economics. You have to understand the basics of politics. You have to understand a lot about organizational behavior. You have to understand a good bit about law, right? You have to understand how, at least how the legal process works and, and rights and duties. What you don't have to understand, what you ought to be understanding, is at least enough tech to speak it the way I speak it. Better still, you need the people who are actually doing tech, talking to, sitting side by side with the people who are focusing on public problems coming from any other areas. And right now, that conversation would look like all of you on one side and a few white guys on the other. And that's a problem. 
So I will say that's why I think it's a problem. Um, I'm going to offer one, one reason why I think, from my own perspective, why there are not enough women in it. And this is highly personal. So I'm a, you know, a, a, I was a superstar high school student who was told not to take calculus because I was a girl. Now I'm telling you how old I am, right? But I'm not that old. And in Virginia in, in the early 70s, I was told not to take calculus. So I've never taken calculus, which immediately says to me, if you tell me that tech is math, I'm terrified of it. If you tell me tech's a language, I've got no problem. I'm great at languages. I speak French. I speak German. I'm learning Italian. I have no problem. So if you tell me that tech is a language, which it is, so coding is a language, I have no problem at all. And yet in my world, it was always described as math. Now, I believe women are just as good as, at math. I believe all of that. I believe we should be pushing that. But I'll just say, in terms of the perception and the stereotypes that we still labor under for many, many, many girls, fewer than it used to be, I think part of the problem is that we're not describing coding fully enough. And that if you tell people it's a way of speaking another language, it is much more female friendly to many women uh, than it is today. So I, I will end with that, except I have to just say I love having Megan sitting next to me. When I was in the State Department, Hillary Clinton invited a whole group of women to come and talk uh, about uh, tech and other things. And Megan got up there, and she starts talking. And within about five seconds, I went to the woman next to me and said, who is that woman? <laughs> <laughs> So it's lovely to have you here. She's the chief technology officer. Yeah, so. <laughs> Make it. You know, it's, uh, just to pick up on what you were just saying, I, I have an analogy. I'm, I sometimes talk about us being a government as, you know, we haven't had technical people at the table. Yeah. You know, when we're policy making uh, for a long time, we, we do it very well when we're at war. If you look at yeah. World War II or other things, right. we're like, bam, we need all Americans. We pull all Americans. But during, during times of peace, we're not thinking that way. And it's almost like we're driving down the road with this awesome car full of great talent and one or two wheels are flat. Right? And so we just can't go because the tools of the 21st century include all of the things you said. And, and that includes technology actually in two forms. One is um, the more sort of clear end technology, using the technology as a way to do something. The other is the network yeah. itself, um, which, which it, uh, kind of the digital natives are doing this all day. Right, sort of texting and tweeting and talking to each other and sort of federating and solving problems in a very lightweight networked way where the talent is integrated. And, and so not everybody's using those tools. And bo both are really important for how we think as an ecosystem for solving problems. And because there's way more resource available everywhere if we just could find the person who has the solution, connect them to us, et cetera. On this specific topic, um, I often divide the problem into three sections. One is sort of kids. So that sort of pre-K to 12 group of which there's different things at those levels. But really, what are we doing in school to make sure that everyone knows they should have numeracy and literacy? And he never, if you, as a grown-up, you would never say that unless, unless there was a specific disability issue, you wouldn't be talking about how, uh, you know, reading was so hard. I just, you know, right, I just didn't, you know, I just didn't really get it. You know, but you say that all the time culturally about math and science, which is a crazy thing if you think about it. And I think uh, we, we are failing to teach in the way that people would enjoy learning it, and we're making people mm -hmm. terrified. So those who can do active things, that matters a lot. Active learning, why are we doing this, historic context. Uh, young people don't know that, for example, you talk about computer languages. Grace Hopper invented the yeah. idea of having a language in English, like a compiler, a translator, that would go to the machine code. She is like an Edison-level American. Everyone needs to know who Grace Hopper is, amazing American. And in fact, just in, in history, there's so many people, uh, women and, and people of color, who've been fundamental parts right. of inventing things. And because we haven't written that history, the other day I found out a woman invented the dishwasher. You were looking at I'm like, these surprise, things. Surprise. And, and, her, <laughs> and her company got bought, you know, right. merged with what is now KitchenAid. Like, why don't, why don't I know Westinghouse and I don't know about uh, Josephine? So she won the Chicago World's Fair top prize, uh, built a business that she sold to all these hotels, and we just don't know about her. Like, this is crazy. Uh, so, so that's the K-12 stuff. With, high, with the college students, there's a lot of work being done because sometimes, especially in tech, you can come with a lot of experience. And so, so Harvey Mudd's been doing best practice, dividing the entry class mm -hmm. so that someone who's been coding for eight or 10 years and made an app and sold the company, whatever they've done, 
you know, is not in the same class as someone who's starting. And just being smart about not only applied and all the things in K-12. And then this big one, which I think we're really focused on, is how do you keep people at the table? How do you bring them in, you know, sort of advancement, hiring, paying attention? And maybe just to be provocative, a friend of mine, uh, Natalie Jeremy Jenko, said um, that she actually felt like it might be a mass protest. That actually the lack of women and people of color in tech might be a mass protest on the culture. Oh. That it's actually an inversion of what we're thinking. Oh, the poor people of color and women who can't, who do we need to help them? Actually, maybe they're protesting uh, a culture that's incredibly unwelcoming um, and, and not helpful. So I just thought it was, to me, that I've been thinking a lot about that. She said that recently. I thought that's, that's interesting. Independent of all that, we need to debug it and fix it. And not only has it historically been much more balanced in terms of gender, uh, and it was not fair in terms of race, but, it, but there have been people of color at elite levels the whole time. Katherine Johnson calculated the trajectories of Alan Shepard, John Glenn, and the Apollo mission, African-American woman who didn't seem to be in the Apollo movie. Uh, so <laughs> not sure where she was. Um, but so getting, getting that right. Uh, I think matters a lot, and figuring it out because all of the math shows that products are better, companies are better, per financial performance, everything's better if we're a diverse yeah. team. And I think, especially for our most pressing problems, whether it's poverty or cybersecurity, other the more diverse the team, the better we are going to be to kind of protect ourselves and advance society in the ways that we need to do by getting this figured out. Jessica. All right. Well, I think about this on a substantive level and also on a personal and visceral level. And on the substantive level, I mean, just look around. The ones and zeros that are the vocabulary of modern computing have become the language of our digital age. It's just that the people who speak that language and work with that language do not look like the rest of the population. And you can look just like with statistics with women. They hold about half the jobs in the economy, but only a quarter of the STEM jobs. And there are similar statistics for Latinos and African Americans. And I look at that gap and I'm troubled by it. I'm troubled by it as a simple matter of equity. But I'm also troubled by it because I think it's a lost economic opportunity. And I think that we can do a lot if we start sizing this problem and talking about it and developing solutions. But on a more personal and visceral level, I came to this job about two and a half years ago. And I come from a long line of science and math nerds, and the most rebellious thing I could do was go to law school. <laughs> but um, you go out on the circuit once you come to these jobs. You start getting mic'd up, and you start talking. And I would go to big engineering conferences, and they're engineering conferences, so there's no mood lighting. You can look out and know who's in the audience. <laughs> and you'd see hundreds of men, and I could count the women on my fingers. And then I'd spend some time with investors in New York, in California. And most of the time, I was the only woman at the table. But it really all came home to me when I was abroad, ironically enough. I was at a big Spectrum conference. And I spoke there in, on the stage. And it's European, so it was dark. I couldn't even tell you who I was speaking before. But when it was over, I decided I needed to use the facilities. So I demiked myself and ran off into the hallway, looked around for the bathrooms. And there was this long line snaking out of the bathroom, the men's bathroom. And I went in and I used the women's bathroom and there wasn't a soul in there. And I remember somehow you don't choose where you have your epiphanies. But walking out of the bathroom <laughs> that day, thinking that, you know, you should start talking about this. Because what you know intellectually, you are now experiencing at a visceral level. And I think we need to do something about it. Yeah, so um, I also think about this in three ways, but different kind of axis a little bit. Um, and so for me, it's kind of coming out of um, what I call a grassroots policy background, meaning simultaneously doing community work and also thinking about some of these uh, policy things. So, so for me, the first bucket is actually definitely around our public education system, and it's very apparent to me, um, and after many years of doctoral research and so on, that there's a problem there, right? Um, so we have uh, systemic inequity in how schools are funded, and where you're born really determines a lot about your access to computers and those kinds of things, right? So, um, and also the curriculum that you are gonna be receiving, right? So I think I'm definitely with Megan on that, that there is really stuff happening in the classroom that is devaluing the inherent worth of people of color and women as innovators. And I actually went to school at Purdue to be an astronautical engineer and did not learn about her until years later, right? 
Um, I was one of like four women in that class, and I also came from a family of people who didn't go to college, right? Um, I uh, was walking, looking around at people who did not look like me, who could not have a conversation about what it was like to have an incarcerated parent, for example, those kinds of things, right? And so there is this stuff that happens in those um, educational settings that is difficult for students. And we often say things like, yeah, but you know, what are we gonna do about that? That's just kind of people's behavior. We actually legislate in the opposite direction all the time, right? In terms of um, what history is taught in schools, how funding happens, right? So part of that is about curriculum stuff. Um, and I've been teaching programming for 15 years, right? So, uh, and usually I get assigned to the non-traditional students, the um, first generation college students, the women, the people of color. Um, and I'm with you because when you say, actually program is like giving instructions to a really dumb robot or perhaps a toddler. That means moms are very good at it, right? That means all of this kind of stuff, right? And so actually, it makes a really big difference, right? And when we talk about um, just all kinds of social examples and how we teach things like model view controller, people get it, right? Folks did a skit on Kim Kardashian, I think, for the last fellowship, and maybe Mariella will talk to you about that. So there is the kind of curricular, <laughs> cultural curricular nature of what's going on, and there's just tons of research that tells us we can do better about that. But the other is that there's other stuff around that public education bucket so I did my doctoral research in Ohio, which is a state where the school funding formula has been found unconstitutional three times because of its capacity to uh, recycle the income level of parents and the income level of students, right? Um, it ties school funding very, very closely to property taxes, right? So if you're in a wealthy neighborhood, um, there's like $10,000 difference per, per, per pupil per year spending in Ohio within a same city sometimes, just by neighborhood, right? So when that's going on, like, y'all, we can't have that. Right? Th that we can solve, it's wrong, right? But the problem is there's nothing that says when you find a, a funding system unconstitutional, you are supposed to do X. That doesn't exist, right? So we have to handle that stuff. Um, so the second bucket is that, yeah, ideal situation, we would have a good public education system that gave everyone equal opportunities and that people were coming out as interested in this and that whatever field depending on their demographics and gender, like that stuff wasn't convoluted, right? But that's not what we have. And so while we are trying to repair that stuff in the long run, we're also seeing this popping up of all of these uh, dev boot camps, other programs that are trying to kind of plug that gap in the short run. And I actually see very concrete issues going on there, where there's this program, this program, this program, this program, attempting to form a pipeline, but why don't we spring it up in the leaks between those, those, those little joints, right? Um, for two reasons. One, we either don't know each other in the ecosystem, so I kind of make it my professional business to know everybody in the country who is working in one of those programs. And um, I'm getting there, you know. Uh, and number two, we actually don't have a standardized competency, not certification, not certification, but competency that essentially handles risk mitigation. So both for the job seeker and the employer. Meaning, if one of our fellows, um, so we train uh, people with a background in community organizing, racial and economic and gender justice to be coders, right? Folks who don't have coding experience but who are really good at talking about these issues once they're in a workplace. Um, for them to join our program, uh, they have to know that something's gonna come out the end of that, that that's really gonna get them a job, that it's really gonna prepare them. Um, a lot of dev boot camps don't have that stuff, right? They're relying on other things. And similarly, employers, when they're saying, I wanna hire a junior developer who is a Python ninja, actually, that means nothing, to be honest, right? Um, and it is actually possible, I think, for us to develop some workforce competencies um, or some form of you know what you're going to get out of those programs before we expect employers to take on some of the either risk or educational lift. And so I'm actually really excited to work on that in 2015 with a bunch of folks since I went to school for one of the world's most boring things, which is writing education policy and competencies, right? Um, it's also, that's also really important because this is an industry that values show me what you built. Not just your degree or, uh, you know, I've taken, I've watched this one video on code school, right? Um, so we actually have to tie those competencies to look at my GitHub account or whatever, right? So I think we can do that. Um, and then the third thing that I think is the problem, quite honestly, is that we are still in a situation of very, very strong inequity, gender and race-wise, everywhere in this country. We can see it in legislation. We can see it in our daily lives. I see it every day when I'm teaching. So when I'm teaching white guys who are second generation college folks in Indiana and they get an error in their program, the first thing they'll do is be like, I wonder if it's my semicolons, right? When you're teaching people from a background where the story is we don't do this stuff, you can watch this happen in the classroom, right? And a couple of the fellows in the room can probably attest to this. That when you get an error, you're going, oh, everything is broken, I can't do this, and people like me, because you're fighting so much other stuff, right? So when someone is electing out of these industries, the protest idea is interesting, right? But um, 
I might also pair that with the idea that people aren't dumb, right? They're actually operating based on real feedback that's happening all the time and making rational decisions in a lot of situations, right? Um, because for every moment that we go and say, you can do this, you can do this, they have had like 200 messages by the time they get to us that month or that week that are telling them the contrary and pressing on their chests and saying that this is not right. So I honestly think, and I will say this um, without always having allies on this statement, but that if we believe that one of the most pressing issues in tech right now is the racial and gender composition of our workforce, then we can't define tech policy as things that are about wires, computers, whatever, only, right? We actually have to make it our job to handle racial and gender inequity because kids are listening to us saying you can do this and waking up and watching this country go to war over the statement Black Lives Matter, which is ridiculous, right? That is not a debatable uh, sentence to me. But if that is happening, what does that mean to that kid, right? So um, all of this is to say that I think that tech people actually have a, a, a very significant role in becoming involved in other things too, if we don't fix some of those systemic things that, that are real policy issues and get on the side of justice on that stuff, we're going to be stuck. Go ahead, yeah, jump in, please. Say, um, a data point, I love what you're saying, a right. uh, data point about media, you know, what mm -hmm. messages are weighing right. on people's chests. Yeah. In, uh, Gina Davis did this amazing work on, uh, on gender and TV, and in children's television, mm -hmm. It's, uh, they measured what jobs, you know, in addition to princess, what job do people uh, <laughs> hold in children's television? And uh, it's five to one. Yeah. Uh, just in general, if there's four characters on TV, only one of them's a girl in children's and family TV. So it's not balanced generally. But in the jobs, out of, out of every five characters, only in STEM, only one uh, is a girl or a woman. And in in uh, computer science, on TV, for our mm -hmm. children, it's 15 to 1. Mm -hmm. So every day you watch TV, and you, the boys are learning, oh, boys do this, and the girls are learning, girls don't do this, and you know, ninjas plays. Well, look at Big Bang Theory. I mean, right. Big Bang Theory is a classic example. Both my sons watch it all the time. There's like, there are no women. There's like one, you know, and they're always, they're, they're never at the core. They're the Smurfettes. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. Right. I mean, well, it's interesting because Megan and Aliyah, you both started with uh, what I would say the, the pipeline issue here, this public education issue. And I'll, uh, I'll say, my, share my focus group, my 13 year old daughter mm -hmm. who, uh, who, who calls herself a, a math and science girl, mm -hmm. just, maybe just to please her dad, but it's okay. Um, and uh, I told her I was going to do this panel. She was horrified slightly, but she also, like, when I asked her, like, what's going on here, her first answer was like, duh, like, you know, when the girls were really, when we were really, when the girls were really young, the boys were a little bit better, a lot of, a lot of the boys were better at math, and, you know, they all kind of learned that they could be really good at math, and we all learned that we could, we would be better at other stuff, and now, you know, she's in middle school, and 80% of the advanced math class is boys, and it's just this reinforcing exactly. cycle, right? How do we start to address that? I mean, do we think that's a real, that's a, that's a real characterization, one data point, but it's backed up by some other, a lot of data out there. How do we begin to touch that? Is it, is it about these, role, these messages that are coming from media? Is it about something we need to do in the classroom, all of the above? I think it's multi-point. Well, right. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about that is at the same time, girls are wildly outstripping guys across right. the board in high school and college yeah. and professional school, right? So it, my sons would just say, well, yeah, girls are smarter than boys because the b girls are way ahead of the guys, except in this very small area, right? So, and, and I should say, by the way, in, my daughter wasn't saying that. They, they said the girls catch up. Like, there's, right. no, there's no doubt about it. They're all, they're all as good, maybe even better. But the question of sort of very early on, how do these messages get exactly. sent, right? Exactly. And what well, can we so do about it? Well, so I was just saying, so there, there's got to be a way of taking what is overall, so Liza Mundy's book on the richer sex or Hannah Rosen's book on the end of men, I mean, the statistics are very clear that if you, if you have kids who are, you're trying to get them into college these days, there's affirmative action for boys mm -hmm. because the girls are doing better overall. So there's the, there's sort of a big trend, and yet in these particular areas, going into tech. So if you're, if you're looking, I bet if you're looking at, well, I don't know about Harvey Mudd, but if you're looking certainly at Caltech or MIT or the places that the top computer scientists are coming out of, you're not seeing this overall trend. But you are seeing it everywhere else. So there's got to be some way to. Yeah, the, well, I was going to say, that what's interesting, there was a study, uh, when I was at Google, there was a study that they did, some colleagues did. Um, and interestingly, they studied, uh, you know, why are kids opting out? And it was matching to all the research that, that about kids needing to, uh, you know, have hands-on active experiences so they understood 
not just the facts, but why this is fun, right. getting their confidence with it. They needed to understand why people were doing that. Mm -hmm. um, they needed to uh, you know, sort of know a little bit of some context about, about people. But it was, there was a whole set of boys who also were opting out. So it's, it's in service of all of our kids, including the boys and girls, to opt all of our children into STEM topics as well as you know, history right. and writing and, and make them sort of fluent in all of these pieces. Um, the, the boys uh, in that study were especially, the boys who opted out, were especially focused on impact. They didn't, they had the same issue the girls. They didn't see, no one had said in the classroom why we were doing this. Other so the math, math was in service to the math. Right. You know, just like we're doing mm -hmm. this, this equation not because Catherine needs to send uh, Alan Shepard out and right. bring him back. You know, like there's no context for right. why we're doing it. Really important stuff in, in the pipeline there. So I think just, uh, and also this hands-on active learning, it doesn't cost more. It's just a better way of learning, uh, and we should we need to move to that and figure out how to let our master teachers lead us there. I, I also think we need to be a lot more aggressive about talking about role models. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every child in school should know who Ada Lovelace is and Grace Hopper. Absolutely. And when they turn on the television, they should see better statistics mm -hmm. when it comes to women and their representation than what we're learning from the Gina Davis Institute. But one source for optimism is I think that the administration's Connect Ed initiative and the FCC's efforts to reboot the E-rate program are in time going to really make a difference. When we start to promote really high-speed broadband to all of our schools, eventually a gigabit to all of our K through 12 schools, we are going to create a market for teaching tools, devices, and STEM education that is more project-based and different from the sad and tired textbook universe probably everyone in this room grew up with. And I think if we can reinvent our schools at the earliest ages with that kind of thing, we can produce a different pipeline, a more equal pipeline, and one that engages more kids and more different kids in STEM education a lot earlier. Um, so for, for, to me, uh, for me, there's two sort of radical ideas. Um, one is, what would it be like if computer science education was required? in schools. Like what would happen then? From yeah. elementary school. Yeah. From elementary yeah. school, right? Yeah. Um, and like so language. I, but that's language language right. Required. So that's I found not crazy like right. countries like Estonia no, exactly. are doing right. that right, right. now. That's, you, yeah. Right. And so I use radical why, as like why, this is goofy, right? Yeah. And not why don't we have that now? So here so I can actually I had but some interesting really really insightful conversations with um, some uh, some city of DC uh, decision makers and then just other lawmakers and stuff. So every Thursday night we have this thing called Community Hack Night here in DC, which is the premise is just upholding the inherent worth of women and people of color as innovators, and you are guaranteed to get the word hello when you walk in, which is different than many tech events, right? And someone will say, "Hi, what you here to do?" And if you say coding, what's that? Uh, 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 now what? Then we won't assume you're stupid and we'll get you started, right? Um, so. We have people visit us every now and then who are like, wow, there's this women and people, mostly people of color, like group that meets to talk about social justice tech and to do this stuff. Like, I really want to talk to them. And um, we always get decision makers saying, I know, I know, I know, your kids don't have computers in their schools because we hold these in Ward 8 and, and more recently some more in um, Northwest DC. Um, and they're saying that, yeah, I can't require computer science education if math and reading competencies aren't even there yet, which cognitively actually doesn't make tons of sense. Because if you have, I have a focus group too, so that's my nephews and my niece who are seven, eight, and six. And like, <laughs> this is a robot piece that we actually use in making robots with them, right? They can think algorithmically and they can make computer programs. They don't read all that great and they hate math, right? Those are separate, right? So I think that we have to listen to cognitive science and the fact, and actually, if you're into computers, maybe you're going to read better because it's fun, right? right. So there's, th there's definitely that assumption that I hadn't realized was in place around people's decisions about whether they introduce funding for certain kinds of programs. So um, we can all think of classes we wouldn't have taken had they not been required, right? Um, education has always been a battleground in this country for separate but equal conversations. And we have that happening right now, right, around class and race and gender with respect to tech ed. So I think that's a really, really um, interesting question. And I think you look at countries who ad admitted that they had a poverty problem and an equity problem, handled it, and made those things required. And now we have India, like <laughs> things like that, right? Um, the second thing is that technologists seem to get talked about only in math and science classes and computer classes, which is weird to me. So we had a DC Femtech event, which is the DC like, community of women in tech organizations. And um, Code for Progress's game was you had to identify these three women technologists who were all women of color, right? And everyone was like, is that Ada Lovelace? 
And I was like, she white? They're not, you know, no, you know? And um, they were like, well, who is that? And I always, uh, and I didn't say coders, I said technologists, right? So I, every time I do um, panels, I ask people to please put your hand up if you're a tech person, and I'm asking you now. There's some serious gender disparity in what just happened. <laughs> I will say it again in which, you, okay, so notice I did not say, are you a coder, right? I said, are you a tech person? And I think I have a personal kind of war on the dichotomy between tech person, not tech person, because in the age of smartphones, that don't make no sense, right? Um, so I also think it's important because we get used to saying tech, oh, I'm not in tech. What does that mean? Just like you were saying, that's strange, right? Every, you know, um, when I was young, it manifested in terms of like, you can fix the VCR, right? <laughs> now it manifests in terms of, yeah, I mean, I think that these, like a woman who was advising one of our fellows who works at the Sunlight Foundation, was like, well, I'm not a tech person, but I do know that there's something weird going on when these two APIs mash up right here, and I think that this one call that's being made to, I was like, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> Why are you saying that, right? And so for me, I always say IDB Wells is my favorite data scientist. And everyone's like, what? You know, no, she did not have a Postgres database, right? Um, but that is the woman who walked around and took down data of every lynching in the United States that she could have access to and did amazing analysis of it. Because to me, we have to reinvent and innovate about what innovation really is, right? She, to me, is one of the most innovative data people ever because she found a way to look at data science. And she actually did data science, right? She calculated means and everything around why they were, you know, um, and make social impact with it, right? I mean, Flappy Bird is cool, right? But like, to me, that's not the kind of innovation that I'm really excited about. And the reason that we, again, recruit activists and community organizers is because they've demonstrated innovation in looking at a system and cutting through it and hacking in other ways, right? So it would be great to see those kinds of people talked about as technologists, as innovators in other fields too, because innovation has now become like synonymous. If you see the Hulu ads about innovators while you're watching your show, um, you know what I'm talking about? Innovators are the new blah, blah, blah. Yeah, some people nod in their heads. They're all like tech people or startup folks, but really the, the ability to um, think about technologies um, is, is a really, it spans, right, coding and all of that kind of stuff. And so I think being able to lift up some of those, first of all, brings more women and people of color into the field and into the picture and into the history. Um, and second of all, like, gives us permission to say we're tech people, which really helps us learn, right? Right now we're all like, well, I don't know. Like, I find myself being like, I'm not really a back-end coder, you know, because when I test this DevOps thing for 100,000 users load testing, I'm not, you know, my scripts aren't <laughs> that great. Like, I do stuff like that, right? So if I'm doing that, I can only imagine elsewhere. You know, it's also the future. Like, name a job or aspect yeah, yeah. of your civic life that is yeah. not going to include some yeah. part of technology. Yeah, right. There's nothing. Right. So right. if we know that to be true, we should be embracing technology in mm -hmm. so many more ways than these traditional categories of right. coders you, or yeah. computer people. And you should watch people come into those hack nights with app ideas. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing! Because, um, you know, we, we feel like it takes less time to teach coding syntax than to teach a racial consciousness or to teach, like, power analysis. And like, they'll be like, we should make an app that does this, this, this. And the reason that I do this job now is because I, I hired some of the smartest innovators ever to door knocker jobs for years over and over again in Ohio, right? And they'd come back and be like, we could do this better by blah, blah, blah. Didn't have access to coding, right? So um, yeah. This Go ahead. Was it the, um, I didn't bring, I have, a, I usually take an Arduino or Raspberry Pi around, which is <laughs> basically the board from inside your cell phone. So imagine that. Um, the UK, is uh, just announced a, a new Raspberry Pi is $35. Mm -hmm. uh, so the current one is seven bucks. They are distributing that across all of their kids in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So think of like Steve Jobs and Wozniak with the homebrew mm -hmm. kind of board. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, get me a monitor. I got to get a keyboard, plug in a speaker, and sort of made the first kind of Apple computers. Same thing, only you know, with this super cheap thing. So the kids in the UK are starting to have that so they can understand what physically is inside their cell phone and starting to make it do things. Mm -hmm. You know, just simple stuff in second and third, fourth grade. Mm -hmm. But to your point, like a kid who, my friend, Dr. Sue Black, who works on the curriculum there, she's like, Ch children learn to cook. They can understand an instruction mm -hmm. set. They can mm -hmm. understand coding. You don't need some advanced math. And it's, it's one of the mistakes we make in teaching. We want to fill them with all these facts so then they'll be capable of doing the thing rather than mm -hmm. have them do things and then just in time wanting to know chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a really fun hackathon uh, in the fall that one of my colleagues made uh, around games. And so the Angry Birds team came. Mm -hmm. And they had this idea called Billion Dollar School. 
And so their idea was uh, you would come into school and you wouldn't be separated by we're going to biology class or these classes. Instead, you'd work on a billion dollar problem like dirty water. Mm -hmm. And by working on that problem together, you of course had to learn some chemistry and some uh, history and, and geography and other things. But just thinking about things in this more active way. And that, that actually goes to your point about uh, certifying competency. I mean, actually having competency, not, not just a certification, but competency. So Kevin Carey, who runs our education program has a book coming out called The End of College. And what he's really describing is the revolution in on-demand learning. So it's exactly as you describe it, where you're working on a problem and you learn, as many of the great inventors and innovators and autodidacts of history have, you don't think, oh gosh, now I have to ha take a chemistry course. You think, I need to learn how these bonds work uh, or I need to, to understand the structure of this. And here's the course that will let me do that. And it's online, or it's online and physical. It can be a mix. And I will be, then be, my competency will be certified, not that I took a three credit course, right? And, and so that revolution is coming. It's already here in some places. And that then makes, then you can re-engineer learning, right? Because then you can absolutely start with the problem and pull in what you need to know to solve it rather than the idea that we train people with all this stuff and then we let them loose on problems, where often there's a mismatch anyway. So yeah, we're in Washington, so I have to ask the, sort of the Washington question, what, what can, is there a role for government or what can government be doing? What can policy do here? I mean, we've talked about a couple of like, I, what I would think of as almost like terrific ideas that happen a little bit in isolation, right? You know, the, you know, the billion dollar school or the tech meetup. How do we scale these things? And is there, is there, a, is a, role, is, is there a role for policy here? I think yeah. big, so we should talk a little bit, you got, you know, sort of the right. whole Connect Ed and it's the great. FCC's right. uh, strategy there is incredibly interesting. One, one of the things, you know, ideas come from everywhere. So it's not like government has to have the ideas. So you, you just want to find the best ideas, sort of like the angel investors and venture capitalists. Find the person with a great idea and get them scaled. So one of the things that we can do a lot in government is convening. Mm -hmm. um, whether the president brought together amazing, uh, for a league of the innovative schools, sort of the superintendents who are really getting this done as a precursor to learning and seeing, learning from each other and hearing what they were doing so that we could create the right policy and environments for things like Connect Ed. Um, so getting those cohorts together and hearing from each other is really critical and that's definitely something whether it's federal government and you're doing it across uh, the states or whether it's city government um, pulling together key stakeholders because the solutions are there yeah. and people have them and just getting them interconnected is key. I also think government's really good if we start setting some goals. We watched over this past summer a lot of the nation's largest technology companies come out with data about how diverse or less than diverse their workforces are. And I don't think you can manage problems you don't measure, so that's a good start. But I think the next step is let's have a goal. You know, we hear over and over again that in the next decade there's going to be 1.4 million new STEM job openings. And right now we only have 400,000 people in the pipeline to fill them. What if we just decided that next million is going to be a million for diversity? And if we went back to all of those companies right now and public institutions that profess to care about this and say, what are you going to do to make that next million more diverse? Because I think that we've started to me measure this problem. Now we've got to get into the mode of goal setting. And I think government, with its convening, can help that. We've started doing a little bit of work um, with St. Louis and Louisville and a bunch of cities who are interestingly doing a terrific job with coding boot camps. Um, and reaching into diverse communities, pulling people through those, and then working with the local hiring folks who typically are saying, I need someone with a four-year degree, I need, and, and instead are open to hiring somebody yeah. uh, with a different background, a three-month background, et cetera, in training and maybe apprenticing them in. So getting that, those good ideas that are happening, they're happening in Philly and New York, a uh, little bit in Delaware, getting those moving into all the cities. You know, that's a good example where our convening power and mm -hmm. pushing. Also, uh, Code.org has been an extraordinary um, public-private partnership teammate on really lobbying and working to helping regional leadership in the schools move through. We got 60 school districts to commit to teaching coding to middle and high school students. You know, $25,000 of money raised for teacher training. Uh, it's top seven school districts, actually, in that 60. Uh, largest Looking school districts largest. in, so yeah, of, yeah. Of, of the biggest ones. So just really, to your point, like setting some goals and pushing right. and finding collaborative teammates 
um, so, so that each person can kind of move the ecosystem forward like this. Mm -hmm. it, it does also, though, mean, and this is more controversial, it means attacking traditional credentials, or at least making very clear they're not necessary, which is something people They're not are, the only path. They're not the only path. You can choose those, yeah. but you can choose other paths. There's a mix of how you get Right. That. But th that's harder because you know, we, everybody does hire themselves. So we, we're OK with dropping out of college as long as you're dropping out of Harvard. Right? I mean, there's no question, right? The idea that, fine, Silicon Valley's full of people who dropped out of college, or, you know, Peter Thiel's paying people to drop out of college or not go. That, but that's still assuming, you know, you've got this very high set of potential credentials, maybe even if you didn't get the degree. We actually need to be, I think, to push harder on the idea that, wait a minute, you know, you really can get to the same place with certifications, with three months, at least you can get to the start. And that means being willing, I think, not just to sort of say this is a way, but to really push back on the idea that the traditional way people have gotten to these jobs is just not necessary. Uh, we've only got about, we've got a little over five minutes left. I want to make sure we get some time for questions from the audience. So are there questions from the audience? We've got one right here. And I know, I think there will be a mic, but why don't we, why don't we start and I'll repeat it. Uh, oh, here comes the mic. Oh, excellent. Oh, good. You see they've, uh, they've gamed it for us here. How about right here? Um, hi, my name is Judy Ayala, and I have a small company in services for higher ed. Um, it's very interesting conversation, especially in my field. And um, going back to school, to the subject about school, and I would like to ask the panel, how much do you think our organization and our education policy um, feels that they own the issue of personalized learning and how quickly we give up in that student that maybe is not brilliant or is not getting it the way is um, explained one way. And then we, from there, keep building down the path instead of trying to look for personalized learning. And the other question is talking about badges and certifications, how much also the system immediately trying to get a student into the system kills that um, passion that initially student might have because they have to go through this um, system that we have put um, a young person in. Thank you. I was in uh, an incredibly modern uh, school. We were just in California for the, the, difference, the summit on consumer protection and cyber. Um, and uh, so I was at Pally High School with Esther Wojcicki, who is the journalism teacher there. And um, one of my favorite things, and she's able to have run three or four classrooms as one teacher because she's got the kids. She flipped her classroom 20 years ago, and she has the kids doing their projects. And she said in the first couple weeks when they come in, they can't figure out, like they're waiting for being instructed, and then eventually they figure it out. But they, have cl they, they found some chairs that are on wheels. And they pull a little desk thing in front, and they can put stuff around. And so the classroom just reconfigures based on how they feel. At, you know, like, we need to work together. Oh, now i got to go over. Oh, we need to face, and you're going to say something. So it's a, a totally modern way of being in a classroom. And the kids are, are driving together with then coaching. And, and it's much better individualized learning without technology, per se. I mean, they're using technology for, for sort of word processing, actually, more in journalism and blog posting, et cetera, but, and, and uh, graphics, but not as what we expect from ed tech, which will come. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really interesting to watch. Suzuki, who uh, was the violin professor, um, teacher, uh, he actually he did violins because his uh, father had a violin factory. But his actual thesis was that anyone could learn anything to a very elite level. And his proof point was how we learn language, mm -hmm. that all people learn their own mother tongue to such a perfection level. And it's because the people teaching them don't require them to learn a certain way. Your parents don't say, OK, here's the list for this week to the toddler, right? And here's the list next week. They just adapt with you. And so he decided to do an experiment on math. And so one year, he taught fourth grade math. And he said, every child in my class could get 100% on every test. And he did it, mm -hmm. because he just adapted to them. Yeah. So I think that I'm very excited about where we're going. And I don't think it's all ed tech. I think it's like this kind of teacher like, like mm -hmm. Wojcicki and these others. Yeah, I think um, so. How do policy, just for repeating for the folks on the 
on the web. Mm -hmm. how, how do policy, how can, what, what role does policy have here? How, what can we're we do to try and that. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm hopeful so for Ed, can yeah. I add because I feel so, like connecting right. the master teachers. I feel like so many of our classrooms are stuck in this industrial age where you've got some numbers of children sitting there and a teacher who could be very talented speaking at the front assigning them reading from textbooks that are purchased every seven to ten years by their school district. That strikes me today as completely crazy. That might have been my educational really, experience. Really yeah, <laughs> right. That might have been my educational experience, but it's not the one I want for my kids in this digital age. And I think the kind of personalization and customization you're talking about is going to go part and parcel with digitizing our classrooms. Because when we bring so much more bandwidth into our classrooms, we are going to have a level of data analysis about our students that can be so productive in teaching teachers about what's getting across, what not, what's not getting across. We're going to have new nationwide markets for digital teaching tools that don't exist today that could be so much more creative and so much more project-based rather than lecture-based. And I think that kind of education is thoroughly modern and something we should figure out how to start pushing into our schools. And with the reboot of the E-rate program, which brings broadband capability to schools in every state in this country, I think we are on course to do that in the next five years. And I think that's really, really exciting and is going to be almost revolutionary. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so the individualized, personalized education question is really interesting to me because of basically, you know, when I was trained um, as a curriculum researcher, that we think about learning styles as kind of like two axes of things, right? One is around that whole like kinesthetic, uh, visual, um, hearing, right? But then there's this other axis that's about like social context, community, and those kinds of things, right? Values based stuff, right? And so sometimes I like to agitate people to think about the need for individualized education may actually be about the need for culturally competent education, or rather, education that does not negate. The, um, the, the kind of the knowledge, right, that is part of communities of women and people of color, et cetera, right? So for example, um, so in curriculum theory, there's a concept called the null curriculum. What that means is when you don't say something, you're actually saying something, right? The things you leave out of your curriculum are speaking volumes to those students, right? Um, and so uh, I think about this concept of code switching. If you've ever heard that, it's the idea of like, you know, when I go into different professional or cultural environments, my language changes a little bit. Um, if I was giving an academic talk, I don't really sound as much like I do right now. And then when I'm in the classroom, I sound even wilder than I do right now. Um, <laughs> those kinds of things. But that feminist standpoint theory says that if you are part of um, the minoritized group, it means you have to learn your way of doing things and the majority way of doing things in order to get by and survive. If you're in a majority group, there isn't a survival necess uh, necessity to learn that other mode, right? So by extension, women and people of color and people in minorities communities are very good at code switching. They've practiced it a lot, right? And um, if you begin every coding lesson with to your students of color and say, like, y'all know how you switch environments all the time? We're about to do a whole bunch of that. You got this, right? It really changes things, right? Um, that and c women and communities of color in, in this country have um, so much to be proud of. You know, some, there are some folks who founded this country, but I feel like we built it, you know? Um, and when you're not bringing up the social context of coding and stuff like that in the education, you're not valuing those things that some people are coming into the classroom with, right? You're mostly valuing like the syntaxy stuff and some of what you were talking about, like some folks coming into college, I can launch an app, right? But where are we lifting up the things that other folks are good at that are gonna make them good project managers, that are gonna make them come up with great ideas? And then um, at the point of the workforce, do you all ever interview for those things? Because when we say we hire for diversity, we pretty much are just like, OK, is there a black person and a woman? But reality is you have to ask questions that are about skills related to gender and race and ask them to the white people and men as well. right? So when we ask a question like, which languages do you speak, like Python, how much coding and HTML have you done? We ask a question too, right? Tell me about a time you have done work with a community of color. right? Tell me about a situation you were in in which you had to advocate for women. right? Because I need those skills. Like those are hard skills that take forever to develop. And I, I want those coming in, right? And it's going to save you from lawsuits, problems, <laughs> and it's going to make generally better coworkers. And that should be part of what we're looking for in both training um, 
students and techies and when we hire as well, right? So we want to look for those things and that, that means our policy has to think about how do we value those things within tech and science as well, right? They are part of creating a good techie. Yep. So. Well, other other qu questions out there? Right up here. You're, allowed, you're allowed to You're allowed to clap. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm Jeff Landau uh, with The New America here. Uh, there's a lot of focus, I think, on the pipeline problem of getting people into tech, but I think what's been missing from this panel is the problem of retention. Mm -hmm. um, you see a recent study, I think last year, showed that half of the women surveyed mm -hmm. who were in computer science had left within a year because of harassment, because right. of being underpaid, because of being underappreciated. So my question is, what would a panel of former women and people of color in tech look like? And how do you think that their analysis of the problem and presentations of solutions might differ? Great point. We kind of ran out of time. So yeah, but I'm glad you're raising it now. So thoughts yeah, on that retention? It, it, not only retention, but also advancement. Um, I remember talking to some of the team from Coca-Cola, and this wasn't in tech, but they were, they have an analysis of, you know, when they're looking at executives or folks are promoting, you know, ready in two years, ready in one year. And they noticed the women are just staying at ready at one year. And so they went in and really worked on what's going on in our culture that we're doing this um, and, and work to adapt it. You know, we face so much unconscious bias. You know, it's systemically in it. So it's mm -hmm. how we make decisions with imperfect information. We really have to uh, become conscious of what we're doing. I think a lot of uh, a lot of tech women uh, and would would talk about sort of the idea of death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. So just you know, a little bit of not only the blatant things that do happen, and we hear about some of those, but just the constant cultural stuff coming at them, whether it's um, unfriendliness to family. Uh, if, if sort of, you know, women are still, there's a great paper that was done around professors. So if you're a young professor, the amount of housework and childcare you're doing for young women and young, young men um, in those positions and trying to get tenure. And eventually by the time you're tenured faculty, that balances out a lot better because you have more money and you're a little better position. But, you know, on the way there, therefore, one group knocks out. But it's sort of death by a thousand cuts in that all these little things. And so you can, you can explain away any individual person, oh, she did this, she did this, she did this. But when you look at it in aggregate, it's just astonishing to see how bad it is. Um, I don't know if other people have specific things that that's. No, but I, you know what? I mentioned before a lot of technology companies now trying to understand what their ethnic and gender makeup is. I think a next target for some of that data would be to understand retention over several years. So the central thing if they work on that? And I, I would just say you really have to be willing to have very, very honest conversations. Because if I just think in my own setting, even a place like New America where we're trying very hard, if the men leave the room, the women have a different conversation. We'll have a different conversation. And we will say things we will not say in front of you. Um, things that bother us, things that are, uh, we will. And, and, may, and I know that the people of color would say the same, uh, and they would say it about me or, uh, or others. So we have to create space to have really honest conversation, because otherwise people leave, right? In other words, you leave rather than saying what's really on your mind, because it's very hard to say, you know, I really felt excluded when you did that. Uh, or this culture really makes me feel uncomfortable because everything in you is A, you may be imperiling your job uh, or, or your chances of adv advancement or how other people will see you. So I think talking about how you can have really honest conversations is one thing we all have to do. And, Go ahead. and then we have to put in place things to happen like when stuff is not right. Okay, so do you have a grievance procedure? Do you have non-discrimination policy? When something goes wrong, is your HR director on your side or are they a gatekeeper to make sure that you don't actually bring it up, right? Um, <laughs> does your really, really, really problematic boss stay in place and you get fired, right? Do you just keep shuffling teams? Like we see this happen and it's really hard in the progressive movement where we all believe that we're great about stuff, right? So like those <laughs> things, no, for real. Like the, and so, so I think honestly the writing is on the wall around some best practices on some of those things, right? Like what happens when someone violates what we believe are the norms, right? And what are our norms? What do we believe is okay and not, right? And help people see that looks like this, that helps, that looks like this, right? 
Um, and the other thing is, our fellowship is a year long. Five months are in the classroom. The other seven are when they're at their job. There's a reason for that. Um, and every week, we are organizing conversations about like, oh my god, I'm the only person of color here. I can't believe what's happening. Like, all I can think about is Ferguson. All they can think about is the server. I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, and then they say just funny stuff that's not funny. And like, honestly, that hack night exists mostly for those people. That's where that happened, right? And so when I say, I was talking to an AT&T hiring manager and said, like, hey, if you knew that in every city that you have employees of color, um, or women, or both, that they could go once a week to a space that was just for them and people in their situation, do you think that would make things better? And they're like, yes, we'll buy all the pizza, right? <laughs> and so we only have it in one city now. But honestly, some things um, kind of have to be communities of support outside the organization, but you can help, right? Like by moving it outside the space, but supporting it either you know, through donation stuff or like or encouraging people to go do that. Because we have to be like with ourselves sometimes just to be like, all right. Um, but I think that there's real stuff in practice that helps. And retention is a huge issue. We actually draw the pipeline like this, because this is where, and honestly, this is where companies really freak out. Because if you leave after you got in, guess who messed up, right? That's how they feel about it. So um, we have to work on that. Other questions? Hi, uh, Dan Henry. Um, so as a member of the white male patriarchy, um, <laughs> it, re it really bugs me to think that when I walk into a room that I can silence certain things and that I can change the tone of the room merely by my presence. And that, that I can make these moves and that there's, well, I'll just ask you guys, what is there that that white men in leadership positions can do in these situations to help foster these conversations? Is there a way that, like, that we can code switch without coming off as disingenuous? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things you can do. One is just being conscious uh, of things. Um, educating yourself around unconscious bias. Like one of the data points that's really useful for managers to know, if there's 10 qualifications for a job, that on average, men will apply if they have at least three, and women will apply if they have at least seven. So it's just in our culture. It's, there's nothing right or wrong about it. It just exists. So as a manager, you should be watching and noticing that, that a set of people qualified for their job have their hand up, and a set of people qualified for the job don't have their hand up, and just be in conversation with people and encouraging them uh, to do that. Because maybe part of the Coca-Cola ready in a year is also that the woman's not saying uh, that she's ready or feeling that, as well as the people evaluating that way. So kind of helping people have those conversations I think is critically important and getting educated, uh, doing the numbers and having plans. I always love to think about, you know, um, during World War II, we uh, had to let everyone in. And so we did. We opened 33 something daycare centers in like three right. months. We right. rebuilt the Pacific Fleet. I mean, in, in off the Marin uh, shipyards, they built 30 th in 33 days. They would build every 33 days or so was the fastest they built those huge tankers. And if you look at the photographs from the Marin shipyards, which is at the Bay Model up in Sausalito, you can see just diverse America, you know, is building all those things. Bletchley Park, which is the the movie imitation game. Um, that was, uh, I think there were 10,000 women on this, or 10,000 people on the site, 8,000 women. The movie is inaccurate, actually. The movie is accurate that Joan Clark did exist, she's real. So did Turing, he's real. Um, but actually, the women in the rest of the film look like they're all clerks, and that's untrue. There were a lot of elite mathematicians. In fact, I met a woman who was five years old on the park, and she told me that they used to um, be next door to Dilly Knox's elite math team. And her mom was always saying to her three-year-old brother, her twin sister, and her seven-year-old brother, shh, the girls are working. <laughs> right? So clearly there were some girls working on saving 11 million lives and shortening World War II by two years. So uh, just amazing elite people out there. So just knowing you know, that, that that's there and helping people out I think is critically important. Yeah. Uh, I would also say have, going through bias training can be really helpful. I, I'm reading... Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which is just a wonderful, wonderful book. And my husband is hyper-rational, and I, so I'm reading this stuff to him about how we all jump to conclusions, how we look at somebody immediately, and he's like, no, no, no. And of course, that's the point of unconscious bias. You don't believe you do it. So I just recently had some surgery, and the surgeon walks in. We see him across the room. And my husband looks at him. He's tall, white, and male, and says, he looks like a good surgeon. And I said, <laughs> QED, right? <laughs> but, but just, and, and it can be funny, because we all do it, right? It's not, we all do it, and we all make assumptions. So doing that in ways that 
force people to recognize that we don't mean to, but we all have these biases, and we at least can learn how to check them is, I think, important. It's the moonshot of this time, yeah. right? And we're in the middle of it, and we're, we are going to debug this. I, I believe it will get there. And I actually am hopeful about the tech industry because uh, of all the industries, it's an industry that is data-driven. And it is um, sort of innovative, and it moves fast once it sees what the problem is. And I think I, there's a waking up going on. I, which you know, is I great. hope it also moves fast with opportunity because women are responsible for a huge portion of the consumer purchases in this country. I mean, there's data out there that say that women are responsible for 85% of consumer purchases, which is definitely not true in my household. <laughs> but if that's true, and you think, that most of our commerce is moving to software and digitized platforms, there's an enormous opportunity if more women participate in the creation of those products. An enormous economic opportunity, which we should all rush to embrace, even if we're not compelled to by issues of gender equity. Um, so I used to be the field director at Equality Ohio, right? And they brought me in to build up, basically, they were like, yo, a lot of our volunteers, okay, all of our volunteers are like, rich white gay men, do something about it, right? And so they're like, you know all of the queer women of color communities, do stuff, right? And so I was doing that, but then honestly, the thing that made the biggest difference in passing um, employment non-discrimination in that state was when we had a real allies program, right? And so in campaign work, I think we think about that a lot. Um, and I feel like your question and other things I see around me really agitate me to think about like actually thinking about allyship in the tech movement as not an attitude, but an active practice. Right, what like, is allyship? what is allyship? The idea. So, um, in the queer movement, one of the most awesome organizations is PFLAG, right? Which is like parents, friends of lesbian and oh. gays, right? Right? Yeah, right? They're showing up because people they love are impacted by these things, right? And so that is an ally organization. There, I mean, depending on where, like Lima, Ohio, it's nothing but gay people, but you know, um, they also have friends who are so. Uh, they, the chapters look different in different places, but you can count on them to show up. Right? Because they have been around for a long time thinking about what does it mean for me to do things that practice, um, put my values into practice around that. And so um, they have such concrete lists of things, right? It means do this, this, this. It means when you hear like nonsense happening, like you need to say something about it and don't wait for a queer person to do it. Um, for the tech space, yo, when people come to hack night and white men wash the dishes with me at the end of the night, I'm like, thank you. Sometimes it actually is not about your thought leadership, but rather your other kind of leadership, right? That is not visible. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, and like if you and and when I tell people that, they're like, "Oh, peace, I'll do that. I'll come and move chairs, right?" Um, and the question of can we learn to code switch? Yes, absolutely, right? Um, a lot of times we talk about how do people act as better colleagues. I think it really begins in your personal life, to be honest, right? Like if you don't surround yourself with people of color or women that you really care about, like how are you going to know our language, right? And how are we going to know that when stuff goes down, you got our back, right? And and when someone says, "Yo, we need to hire more diverse candidates," anybody know one? It's going to sound like crickets. Be if y'all don't have a social network, you know, basically, right? And, um, and so I think, what, how do we do that? That means things like, are there, you know, are there issues of race and gender stuff that really matter to you? Those organizations have meetings all the time, right? Many of them are like, this is a closed space, but you can find out the answer to that, right? And you can go to stuff and like, think about what it's like to help show up and help move chairs and listen, you know, until you feel like you're understanding language a little bit better, like that, you know, but I, so I think in the tech movement, um, we have some active work to do about really the role of allies and like the tech lady mafia has a men's auxiliary which is awesome and bought us pizza a couple months ago for a com you know but but we can do organizing work around that too so i appreciate your question time for one more uh do we have time for one more yes i'm getting a yes how about back there hi i'm jenna ben yehuda just a question about this pipeline concept i'm thinking about um, you're talking about getting kids through K through 12, getting them ready to move through university and graduate programs. They enter the job market. What about the pipelines for companies? Because you have a lot of this, this startup world, right? A lot of these startups really just want to be bought by bigger companies, right? So you have this company, this corporate kind of pipeline. And if those small companies are fewer than 50 people or whatever the FMLA standards are for small companies depending on your state and they're not subject to a lot of these requirements for protections for human resources and they're not they don't have enough time or money or maturity on a number of levels to care about retention <laughs> but then those are the companies that are getting eaten by bigger companies that ostensibly do have those resources 
I guess I'm wondering, is there kind of a pipeline problem on that startup smaller company level where a lot of maybe women and people of color and both start out, a lot of people start in those spaces, but then there's just no movement and that kind of kills it. Like that show Silicon yeah. Valley on HBO. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, the Which truth needs a little help, yeah. right? I the mean, truth, we actually, I'll tell you what we did when I was at Google. Yeah. We, their writer's room wanted to come visit um, to talk about open source, compression, mm -hmm. and uh, one or two other things. Anyway, so we set up a whole meeting for them for two or three hours, and they met top engineers on open source, compression, and these other topics. And at the end, they were laughing. They're like, are there any white men who work at Google? <laughs> <laughs> so we just made sure that they met uh, people of color and women who were elite members that just to try to show them, because these are the writers, and they're writing these characters. And you want to show them that lots of different people do these jobs. But it didn't show up. In the yeah, sure I don't know why. Yeah. 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 But I, the, the point, um, you know, the, the point is, uh, you know, how, how do you help? Like, I remember early on, um, talking to folks about this issue and getting them to think about how to go get people, like to your point, like get it, breaking in. Our country is very racially divided. Our country, the, the talent networks aren't interconnected, so you have to almost break into them and find incredible people. And if you get some people, they'll get other people. So having a practice of uh, really reaching out to different communities to pull them into your company, you're going to have a better company. Really, the better startups set their culture from the very beginning. And interestingly, a lot of the startup teams are more diverse than, than one thinks, than is portrayed on television. Uh, there's always like, like a, the original Macintosh team, Steve Jobs' team was four women and seven men in the Rolling Stone photographs, even though the movies today right. write right. them all out. Right. But they were there, so that exists. But having a, a, being deliberate about that is very important for founders. I went to an event at the SBC uh, last month that was a small business fair um, that was focused on um, people of color and I um, judged at the pitches. All startups of color. Awesome. Like, um, so I think that what you said earlier about this role of convening is really, really important, right? Because um, sometimes when people think government, they're saying, oh, well, I don't know if there's going to be a policy on that. That's not the only role of government, right? The convening spaces are really, really useful um, and just being able to be there um, with folks who are part of that community as a place that has validation in, right. you know, sort of mainstream culture, right? It's the FCC. We were like, yo, we had the FCC, you know. Um, <laughs> and like doing these pitches. You're making us <laughs> much cooler than most people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, That's you're in an right. M&M lyric. We'll take it. Right. We'll take it. Right. Doing, the work, so, right. doing the work to invite people and yeah. reaching out. Yeah. I have a thing that I, I do, you know, you often get names, wonder, incredible talent names. Someone says, oh, so-and-so should come work for you or they're applying. So I always catch that name. I'm like, OK, what's the name? I write it down. And they say, usually it's a majority person, uh, a majority man. And so I'm usually like, OK, and do you know any people of color or women who are as good as that person? And you get a second name. So just developing some fluency practices mm -hmm. for, for collecting other folks and just making sure you're reaching across networks. Because as soon as you get the people together, it starts to move. So I'm hopeful about that. Yeah, my goal is that we uh, reach a point where we don't have to say um, reaching out to communities of color. Anymore, or like getting into their networks because they would already be part of our organizations, right? Like that's the goal, right? And you can't do that without actively like starting now instead of being like, "Whoa, that's a really bad situation." We have to do it. Yeah. With that inspirational <laughs> goal in mind, um, us, we're we're out of time. This was a terrific panel. I mean, obviously, like massive challenges, but also some really practical ideas about things that we could do, things that government can do, cultural changes that we need to. Uh, and, and ways of thinking about the problem. And a little bit of a note of optimism, maybe, even. Uh, so uh, please join me in thanking uh, this, this all-star lineup. <laughs>